Well, Daniel, the prophet, had a vision, as you guys all know. In chapter 12 of Daniel, he says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. At that time, at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And then dropping down to verse 3, it says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars that shineth forever and ever. The Great Commission didn't start with Matthew 28. God has had a desire from the beginning for His people to tell other people about His righteousness, His goodness, His love, His trustworthiness, and His plan. We are in process of continuing with that as he has spoken to his people for generation after generation after generation. When we partake of communion, I sometimes wonder if we are completely aware, thank you Bruce, if we are completely aware of what we are doing. We're, we're partaking in commemoration of what Christ has done. But we are doing something as well. When we partake of the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ, we are joining ourselves to His body and to His blood. We are committing to that sacrifice People don't like to hear about sacrifice a whole lot, and this is not a message about sacrifice. But it's important that we comprehend that partaking of the body and the blood means that we are joining ourselves with that same task to the very end. And the purpose for of it is to bring glory to God. So open up and take your wafer out. Father, we thank you for the body of your Son. Thank you for his stripes, Lord. Thank you for the healing he purchased for our bodies. We receive this emblem in honor of his sacrifice and in anticipation of your coming return, Lord Jesus. Protect. Lord, thank you for this cup. Thank you that you found grace to drink from it, Lord. Establish your righteousness in our hearts, O oh God. Teach us how to cling to you even as you have clung to us. Refresh us, Father as we receive this emblem of the blood which took away our sins. We receive it with thanksgiving. Partake. Hallelujah. Uh, about becoming a disciple and about continuing in discipleship. This is going to necessarily include some thoughts on discipling others. 
we have this responsibility for discipling ourselves. Do you want, everybody know this? Everybody understand this? Part of this accountability is discipling yourself. But then, of course, we look to those who have greater maturity than we have and look to them to be discussing and teaching what they have learned, what they know about the Word, what they know about the process of being a Christian, what they know about life. And, and then we have the responsibility of passing that along to other people, discipling. I want to set this up just a little bit by some quick review here. Uh, in the past several weeks, we've had some very meaty messages here. We, we have had some heart and soul of some of the most difficult passages of Scripture uh, preached to us and taught to us and brought to our memory <laughs> and put them there right, right in front of us. And some of them are hard words. Some of them are hard. When Jesus said to the disciples that were around him that his flesh was meat and deed and his blood was drink indeed, they looked at him and they said, boy, that's a hard saying. Who can hear this? And then some of the other uh, requirements of discipleship. And thank God that they're not necessarily everyday type requirements, but there are times where we're called upon to make really difficult choices. Choices that can impact our family relationships, choices that can impact friendships, choices that can impact careers even in the future. But those all come out of the Word. And they all come out of the mouth of Christ. A lot of this word that's been coming forth has been along the topics of having to do with the difference between your soul life and your spirit life. That is a process that we have to come to understand the difference between because the Bible makes a difference between them. Hebrews chapter 4 <laughs> verse 12 says that the word of God is sharp and powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword and able to divide between your soul and your spirit. When you were born again, your spirit man came alive. Not your soul. And you certainly didn't get a new body. I'm still waiting on that one. <laughs> However, the process of bringing the soul into agreement with the spirit is that process, like, like where Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, to be renewed in the thinking of our mind. So those hard words bring us to that place where we have to, we come to a point where there's a critical, a critical energy has been reached and we have to choose between one path or the other path. And that is the mission of those hard words sometimes. And the Holy Spirit gives us grace to help us hear those and help us to understand those. When the Spirit is moving in whoever's speaking in the messenger like that, He is in part calling the church back to a focus on its first love. It's so easy to become caught up in the busyness of life. Even in the busyness of being a Christian. <laughs> in the busyness of the work of the ministry. In the busyness of caring for family. It's so easy that in that busyness we forget our first love. And that's a part of the work of those hard words is to bring us back to that place where we come to a point of self-examination and, and the question, the question when someone else asks you, are you walking in the path of faith is different from when you ask yourself, am I walking in the path of faith? 
And that's what the goal of these hard words are for. Here, uh, Mike. Huh? Your mic just went out. Is that what's causing that? It says I got full batteries. <laughs> I'll talk louder. Check the cord. Yep. That's as good. I can't think of anything causing it a problem. I can. We can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Just speak again. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just put this aside for the time being. Get your mic. Until we have an opportunity to figure it out. We never had any trouble recording without it, so we'll do that now. This focus on first love. When the Spirit is speaking to us with a word of self-examination, this is what He's talking about. Are you still in love with Christ? Is He still the one that you love the most? We could look at some of the Apostle Paul's closing words to the church at Corinth in his second letter to them. And I'm going to read a passage here from chapter 13 if you want to follow along. Verses 5 through 8. Now I'm going to read this from the message. I sort of like the, the wording here in the message. You know, Paul had to speak some hard words to the church at Corinth. They had things that were out of order. Which was not unreasonable given what they had come from. Mm -hmm. They were a pagan congregation. That was well steeped in the pagan rituals of their worship style for pagans, which included getting drunk, it included wild parties, it included licentiousness, sexual immorality. So that wasn't all that unusual. But the apostle continually poured himself out on that crowd of people, and he continually sent them letters. We call it 2 Corinthians, but actually it's the third letter that we know of, we just don't have one of the other ones. But here's verses 5 through 8 from the message. Test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along. Don't drift along. It's taking everything for granted. Que sera, sera? Uh -uh. <laughs> Paul doesn't say que sera. Paul says, watch out what you're doing. Don't drift along. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. I've heard it said from times past, and you've probably heard this before, if somebody accused you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And that's what Paul is saying to them. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. There's no condemnation in Christ. If you self-examine and the Spirit brings conviction that there's something amiss in your life, there's no condemnation for that. What there is is the opportunity for being better in the future. But if it comes to that, Paul says to them, we'd rather the test showed our failure than yours. If I have failed you, Paul says to them, in some way of instructing you, and thereby because of my failure, you have not yet attained to the maturity that Jesus wants you to, he says, blame me for that. So he's being honest. And he's continuing on, we're rooting for the truth. To win out in you. We couldn't possibly do otherwise. We don't just put up with our limitations. Our weaknesses. We, just, we don't just put up with them. We celebrate them. And then we go on to celebrate every strength. Every triumph of the truth in you. We pray hard that the truth will all come together in your lives. 
I like the way the Holman Christian Standard phrases that last sentence there. We also pray that you become fully mature. The New English Translation translates that we pray that you become fully qualified. To be qualified is to have the necessary understanding, the necessary equipment, and the necessary calling to preach the gospel. Every one of us has that available to us, and that qualification includes the authority and the power that's in the name of Jesus. Paul's heart broke for this congregation at Corinth when, because of the problems that they were allowing to take exist without being addressed in their lives, they were missing that power and they were missing that authority. And Paul's heartfelt and most, most hunger desire was that he could bring these from this pagan lifestyle that was their past to a present where they preached Jesus with authority and power. That Greek word that's used there for qualified is katartesis. And it means that you are thoroughly equipped. There's nothing left out or lacking in your toolbox. You have everything that it takes to preach the gospel. And to do it in such a fashion is that there will be evidence of your relationship with him. Paul knows that it is this fullness of maturity in Christ that shapes the going forth of the ministry of the message of the gospel to others. Paul is honest with them about his own weaknesses and he is willing to take the blame for his limitations if somehow he's left something out and that has hindered or limited their growth. But he also has a determination for them to press on. Yes, he speaks truth to them that would sometimes in some ears seem hard. But his desire is not to bring punishment or condemnation. It's simply to correct, to strengthen what is weak in their relationship with Christ and in their relationships with each other. We saw a lot of that when we went through our study with 1 Corinthians. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul summed up his own personal awareness of this, and also he put in there what his motivation was about how to deal with what he had not yet attained to. Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. I'm reading from the New English translation here. My aim is to know Him, to experience the power of His resurrection. You have to be dead to experience the power of resurrection. Nobody resurrects a living person. That death in Christ, that soul man that has a hold on the world and the flesh and the things around you has to die. It has to die and be buried with Christ so that from there it can be resurrected in newness of life. That's not just talking about waiting for the second coming when all the dead saints arise. He's talking about right here, right now. <clears throat> He wants to experience the power of his resurrection. And then he says this, to share in his sufferings and to be like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. There's the resurrection that we classically think about with the return of Christ. But there's to be resurrections taking place as we walk through this life unto that day. In verse 12, he says, Not that I have already attained this. That is, I have not already been perfected. But I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. 
brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have attained this. Instead, I am single-minded. With this goal in mind, I strive toward the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Failures in your past? Failures in my past. <laughs> Failures in Paul's past. Hang around and wring my hands and weep and moan about it. Maybe up until the point where I finally realize I have to get before the Lord and go, I confess. <laughs> Please forgive. Maybe I have to come before you and say, I confess. Please forgive. James teaches us that there's healing in that as we confess our faults one to another. But it's the upward call. It's the step forward. It's the move on from there that all of the apostles and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God the Father is speaking to you. Don't stay there. Once you realize where you are not walking in the faith the way God really wants you to, and you confess that, don't live there. The Bible says that, Jesus, that God puts it in a sea of forgetfulness from the east as far as the west. That's not who you are anymore. The blood of Christ sets us free from the penalty of sin. Well, this is somewhat of a review compressed of some of the past few weeks. Our goal today and my message to you today is about the pursuit of maturity in Christ. My other goal is to bring this message of the love of God to those who have not yet heard Him call them as we have heard Him call us. Don't walk up to somebody who doesn't know Christ and tell them you have to lay down your life and die daily if you want to be a Christian. They will not have the foggiest idea of what you're talking about. The meat of the Word. And Paul admonished these Corinthians. He said, I'd like to be giving you the meat, but you're not ready for it yet. You're only like those that are ready for milk. The world who doesn't know Jesus is not prepared for you to tell them that you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. They don't understand that. They're not ready for you to tell them you have to lay down your life and die daily. They do not comprehend those spiritual principles. So what do we tell them? What, what do we tell the world who doesn't know Christ? Well, I want to take you to what I think is an excellent place to start. And I'm hoping if you have your Bible, you'll turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61. I believe this has a lot of what lost people want to hear. This has the message of hope. This has the, the word of recovery. This has the strength of healing in this anointing that came upon Christ. And if you're familiar with Luke's Gospel in chapter 4, you know that this is where Jesus quoted from in his own hometown. And they said they were going to march him out and throw him off the cliff. <laughs> Not because of the words that he quoted, but because he had the audacity to say, that's me. Have you got the audacity to say to the people who are blind, hurting, lost, it's Jesus that fulfills all these promises here in this word. It's his anointing, not mine. It's the calling that came upon Christ with the fullness of the Spirit that has set you free. Not the limited Spirit that's inside of my person. 
The Holy Spirit's here and He's inside of you if you know Christ. But you are not the world's answer and neither am I. Paul wouldn't even judge non-believers by what he knew to be Christian morality because he knew that as yet they were not ready and prepared and able to hear that. He judges Christians by Christian morality. But let's look at this in chapter 61 here in Isaiah. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version from Isaiah. Verse 1 and a part of verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's where Jesus, from the account in Luke, that's where He stopped. Now, I've read several commentaries, people that we would understand to be doctors of the Word, knowledgeable and scholars, and I've ran across different ideas. Some people think perhaps Jesus actually stopped here because He wasn't prepared to bring that message of the coming judgment just yet. He was opening their eyes and their ears to the hope of what He could bring to them. Some have said, well, if you were talking with somebody and you began to quote the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty, and you might just say so forth and so on. And some scholars think, well, maybe Luke stopped there because he's talking to a crowd of Jewish people. Surely they know what Isaiah said. In chapter 61. Those are some possibilities, but I want to point out something to you also as a matter of scholarship here. In Luke's Gospel, in most of your modern English translations, the phrase to bind up the brokenhearted will not be in Luke's Gospel. I have researched this rather extensively because I am a dyed in the wool. Hope I die with it, never changing King James Version man. That text from the Greek text, from what's called Textus Recepticus, includes that phrase to bind up the brokenhearted. Most of your modern English translations, many of them which are excellent translations, but most of them are based on what's called the Westcott Hort Greek text. They were good Greek scholars, but they were caught up in what was called higher criticism. Most manuscripts that we have today of the Greek text, matter of fact, the majority of the Greek text include that phrase, to bind up the broken heart. Westcott and Hort relied upon two Greek manuscripts that didn't have it in there. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because you're looking at a boy who has a broken heart. It almost killed me. It nearly took my life. I think it's so, so important that you give the message to the lost that Jesus can bind up their broken heart. That's why I'm spending so much time on this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. To who? To the poor. Now that might, obviously we think, you know, money, people that are down on their luck, hardworking men and women perhaps who 
don't have incredible skills or great education and they're barely living from paycheck to paycheck. But there's good news. Christ brings blessings in your finances. He wants to see you prosper. Now, am I going to get up here and tell you he's going to put you a Cadillac in your front yard and put you in a four-bedroom mansion and all that kind of stuff? That's not my word about that. But my word is that if you will please the Lord with your finances, that He will please you with your finances. Trust in, in Him that. That's good news for somebody who's poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Man, are there broken hearts out there in the world today? Absolutely. You have better believe it. They are everywhere. And it seems that the circumstances of life crowd in on them and people turn their backs on them and lie and cheat and steal and wound and inflict injury with their words and their barbs. They need this message that Jesus will bind up the brokenhearted. There's another passage in Isaiah I love where it says uh, bruised reed will he not break. And smoking flax will he not quench. I relate to that. Is your fire burning low? He's not going to pour water on you. He's going to bend right down close to that little ember that's still left. That's causing that little bit of hope to rise up. That little trail of smoke that's hope that there's hope for your future. He's going to bend right down there and he's going to go. He's going to breathe his life on that ember and bring it back to a flame. That's a God I can celebrate. That's a king I can rejoice in. And that's Jesus. And that needs to be our message to the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. <coughs> Addictive behaviors. <laughs> you want to try to tell me something about them? <laughs> I know all about them. But there's other kinds of captivity as well. There's the captivity of a memory that won't go away. There's the captivity of a word that somebody spoke to you when you were a child. <clears throat> Satan took that and pierced your heart with it, and it was a lie out of hell. And Christ wants to speak the truth to that memory and set you free from that. That's the message to people that don't know Christ. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. That's the return. That's when all debts are paid off. Uh, Jewish scholars tell us that this is a reference back to the 50th year Jubilee. All your debts are paid off. Anything, any land, any possessions you have, they all come back to you. Everything that was yours is restored. This is going to happen when the Lord comes back. You won't wear this frazzled body anymore. Everything that God intended for you to have as your possession because of your riches in Christ, He's going to place it right in your hand. An eternal life. An eternal life. That's the message of Christ to the lost and the dying. Those hard words are for Christians. The ones that are trying to make it. These words of hope and encouragement and life are for the lost. Not that we don't need them. I'm still mending my broken heart. The Holy Spirit's still mending my broken heart. I thank God for Lisa. 
and all the work that she has done to mend in my broken heart. And for Jesus and all the work he has done to set me free from those chains of my captivity. It's an ongoing process. But this is the light that we hold up in front of them. The love of God, the liberty of God, the deliverance of God, the provision of God. What is this all about? What, are we, what is going to be the, the wind-up of all of this? I'm going to close this out real quick with just one verse from Ephesians. Chapter 1. And you can turn there with me if you want to. I'm going to start reading at verse 3, but I'm going to wind up on verse 6, and that's going to be the wrap-up. <coughs> Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him. Don't lose sight of that. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Do you realize you are an emblem of glory to the praise of God, to the praise of Christ. Every man, woman, and child who's, who will stand in the presence of the Lord, and this is all finished and done, is an emblem of glory to Christ. That's what you were born for. That is your ultimate destiny. That's what eternity will represent for each and every one of us. Bringing the power of the glory to God the Father, to God the Son, to God the Holy Spirit. We sang that song this morning. I saw the Lord seated on His throne and the train of His robe fills the temple. Ancient kings, when they would go to battle and conquer somebody else, another king, another majesty, another lord, they would capture his robe, his royal robe, his robe he sat on when he gave judgment forth from his throne, and they would cut off the bottom of that robe, and they would tie so that robe to the robe of the conquering king. Have you ever wondered why his robe fills the temple? He's conquered everything. 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 Nothing left. Everything. Everything that has ever come against you, everything that ever will come against you, everything that ever could come against you, has been defeated by the blood of Christ. And every prince and every principality, every power that thought to exalt itself above Jesus, I reckon Michael and Gabriel have cut off the hem of that <laughs> deity's robe. And they've given that to the cherubim and the seraphim that surround the throne. And they've gone and they've placed that on the hem of the robe of Jesus. And when you look, all you see is Him Lord over all. And nothing left 
to speak a word against it or against you. We're here for the glory of God. Those, we'll call them pre-saints. Those pre-saints that are out there who haven't yet surrendered their life to Christ. Look into Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and take that message to them. Begin that process of making a disciple for Christ. There might be a price to pay. You might tick off a friend. You might tick off a loved one. You might tick off an employer or a co-worker, a vendor. But teach them about the love that God has for them and the price He has paid through Jesus and the availability of their having that love shed abroad on them and a resurrection of eternal life. Are you ready to do this? Are you willing to do this? I hope you are. Because that's what I'm ready for. I want to see the lost born again. And then I want to have the opportunity. And you know what? It doesn't matter to me if this is where they fellowship or if they fellowship somewhere else. I don't know. That's not the issue. The issue is bringing souls to the glory of Christ. That's the issue. And whatever their problems when they come, their tattoos and their rings in their noses and uh, whatever kind of wild clothes they wear, and no matter what color their hair is, no matter what their addiction is, we can bring them in and give them love. Jesus will begin to dress them up in His personality and in His character. Are you ready to do this with me? I'm ready for Onward, Christian soldier, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going on before. Lay that out in front of the world. The cross, the cross. Jesus paid the price. Father, we come with all our heart. We come with our hope before you, Lord. We know that you have created us with destiny in mind, O oh Lord. We know that you have called us. You know that we have been chosen, Lord. And here today, we commit ourselves to surrender to your will, Lord. To surrender to the purpose for which you brought us into the kingdom. Just as Paul said, he wants to apprehend, he wants to capture take hold of the very thing that you captured him and took hold of him for. Thank you, Father, that you save even the worst of sinners, even as Paul made that confession of himself, Lord. And we ourselves know that this is true because of the life you saved us from. Help us to become bold witnesses with the power and the evidence of your presence in our lives, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen. God bless you. I hope there's been something said here today that stirs you up.